In today's farm report, the 2014 Farm Bill relinked the need for conservation compliance with crop insurance premiums. Rod Bain with the U.S. Department of Agriculture has more on the upcoming deadline. Did you farm at a time when USDA crop insurance premium support was connected to conservation measures on your land? It wasn't that long ago that these matters were delinked. But Farm Service Agency Administrator Val Docini says... In this last Farm Bill in 2014, the two topics were linked together again, which means that to be eligible for a federal crop insurance subsidy from the Risk Management Agency, you have to be in compliance with the conservation regulations of the department. And what that means is producers must file a highly erodible land conservation and wetland conservation certification form, or what you may know as an AD 1026. Dolcini notes many farmers and producers already have an AD 1026 on file with their local FSA office. Any number of different programs where an individual receives benefits from the U.S. Department of Agriculture might be subject to these conservation compliance requirements. Most producers have already filled out an AD 1026 if they've been participating in our programs historically. However, this is not the case for some producers, those who are beginning farmers, for example. And as Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack points out, specialty crop producers, many new to crop insurance premium support, may not necessarily have an AD 1026 on file. For many specialty crop producers, this is the first time they've ever had to deal with this kind of thing before. For you producers with an AD 1026 form on file already, it's a matter of updating your information at the local Farm Service Agency office. And FSA Administrator Dolcini says for those who do not have a conservation compliance certification form on file, they need to come in if they are new to our agency but want to participate in these RMA subsidies, come in and fill out that AD 1026. But no matter if your conservation compliance certification form just needs updating or you just need to fill one out altogether, this must be done by June 1st of this year. So your crops will be eligible for the federal crop insurance premium support during the 2016 reinsurance year. And Secretary Vilsack says the June 1st deadline will be a hard one. Because if we extend beyond that, then we're in a situation where it may impact and affect adversely the issuance of crop insurance. So June 1, absolute hard, fast deadline, no extensions, no coming in at the end of the day and saying, hey, can I have a couple more days? June 1 is the date. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. This bird flu situation is not just hurting poultry producers in the 12 states hit by the high path influenza strain, but also producers in other states because several countries have banned poultry from the entire U.S., not just the areas affected. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack told farm broadcasters in Washington Tuesday. 50 to 60 countries have made decisions concerning exports. Uh, In some cases, unfortunately, they are, are opposing a countrywide ban. We're trying to impress upon the 11 or 12 countries that have done that, that that's not consistent with the science and certainly not consistent with OIE uh, requirements, international requirements that really focus on more of a regional approach. Earlier this week, Vilsack called the Chinese ag minister trying to persuade him to lift the total ban on all U.S. poultry, but that request denied, at least so far. Meanwhile, this week, more reports have come in of poultry facilities being hit with the flu all in the Midwest, and Vilsack told reporters it is devastating to those Midwest producers and... We're knocking on wood that doesn't get to the East Coast. In Washington, Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It's spring cleaning time, and if you have old paint, lawn chemicals, and the such to get rid of, be careful how you do it. Gary Crawford with the U.S. Department of Agriculture has more. Here's a quiz question for you concerning water. Of all the available fresh water in the world, what percentage of it is groundwater versus surface water? Ten seconds to answer. Now we're not talking about oceans here, but fresh water. The percent from the ground versus the surface. Time's up and the answer. 99% of available fresh water in the world is in aquifers in the ground. That's Cliff Tryons with the National Groundwater Association, and he told us... I've rarely had anybody come close to getting the right answer on this. Tryons says since groundwater is by far our main source of water in this country, anything we can do to keep it from being wasted or polluted is very important. And it starts for many of us right here where I am now in my... a totally filled up garage. For others, it might be in our basements or our, our storage rooms. Every household has paints, paint thinners, lawn products, cleaning products. You use motor oil if you change your own oil. You have to do something with that stuff. And, and just throwing this stuff in the trash or dumping it in the yard or the woods is uh, something that's not a good thing. In fact, in most places, it's not even legal. And what have I, I, I mean, I've got, 
this, this paint can here and paint thinner. I've got stuff here that was here when I moved in 15 years ago. Cliff Tryon says, for the sake of everybody's water supply, we all need to know how to properly store those things so they don't leak, how to properly use them, which is basically to use them according to the manufacturer's recommendations. And then if you have old product you need to get rid of, how to properly dispose of it so it doesn't threaten the groundwater. And I guess that last one's the most daunting. I mean, where do we find out these things? The first thing you would want to do is contact your local waste authority. In many cases, they can tell us what to do with this uh, old paint and the paint thinner and all of that. And here's a suggestion for those of us who change our own oil and end up with a pan full of the stuff. The last thing we should do is dump it on the ground or, or down a sewer grate. Some of us do make the trek to some waste disposal sites that take it. But for many of us, there may be an easier solution. You may not realize this, but many of the quick oil change services will accept used motor oil. They recycle it. And if that's not an option, Cliff try and suggest a website that can help us with properly disposing of not just the oil, but all the other stuff that's in this garage that could be hazardous. It's wellowner.org. And it will show you services that can take that stuff. So just type in your uh, zip code and it should give you places near you to take all the old paints and other things that, if they're not disposed of properly, could harm our drinking water. Again, it's well owner, all one word, wellowner.org. From my garage, yeah, this is Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He's just back from China. It was a wonderful time to meet a lot of government officials and talk with them about agriculture. And acting USDA chief economist Rob Johansson says it also gave him a better idea of prospects for sales of U.S. farm products to China. First, dairy. China demand has fallen off a little bit in terms of dairy this year, uh, which has led to you know, our forecast for a drop off in dairy prices this year. But I think that's a short term thing, a rebound, and I think there's a, an opportunity there to grow our sh market share. But for U.S. corn, the outlook not quite as rosy. Johansson says Chinese farm policy has boosted the domestic price of corn in China so high that livestock producers Producers are not buying it. Their livestock producers prefer to seek out U.S. sorghum, for example, or Australian barley to substitute away from the sort of lower quality, very expensive corn. And that could continue for a while. However, for U.S. soybeans? They certainly need our soybeans, so I don't think China's going to have any kind of dramatic changes in their policy towards our soybeans. China, of course, our number one customer for U.S. farm products. In Washington, Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Avian flu has trouble with high temperatures. And, as Gary Crawford with the U.S. Department of Agriculture asked, when will the warmer weather cause the avian flu outbreaks to subside, and will those outbreaks start up again this fall? Each nest is twittering, they're all babysittering, it's spring, spring, spring. Ah, uh, yes, and spring may be nice and still cool and wet and pretty, but the nation's poultry producers probably would rather be able to hear... It's summertime, summertime, some, some, summertime, summertime. Yes, and that summertime. is, of course, because avian flu viruses can't tolerate a lot of heat and usually die off in the summer. So just when are these cases in the U.S. going to fall off and cease? And the answer to that... It's kind of hard to just predict a particular date and say, oh, beyond this point, you know, we'll have a drop-off in cases... Dr. David Swade with USDA Southeastern Poultry Research Lab in Athens, Georgia, says it's uh, more complicated than just saying, well, it's reached 90 degrees, so uh, sound the all clear. It involves the temperature itself, uh, the amount of humidity is there, getting to the you know, drier part of the spring and the part of the summer. Dryness also helps reduce the life of the virus as well as the amount of ultraviolet light. Oh yes, viruses don't like the UV rays in sunlight, so it's uh, just hard to know when conditions will combine to get so bad for the viruses that they'll die off. But perhaps an even more vital question that many people are asking is, will waterfowl, which are carrying the virus now, bring that virus right back through the U.S. this fall as those birds migrate south? And will that start this whole thing all over again? It's really not sure if they will be able to bring the virus back south or not or if the virus will burn out. But Dr. Swain says we have to prepare for that potential option. So researchers will be testing birds for the virus over the next few months but Dr. Swain and many other researchers are working on another part of that preparation in case the flu flies back again this fall. We are working on a potential vaccine strain that can be used. And he says they're making progress on that. We have 
a uh, potential seed strain. But once we complete our work, which will include testing in chickens and turkeys, the decision to use that vaccine will only be made if it's necessary in the regulatory process of the eradication. So our work is only on the front end just to say, do we have available potential tools like vaccines to be used? Meanwhile, the officials say the best preparation and defense for poultry producers and operations is stepped up and really tight biosecurity measures. In Washington, Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. In announcing the latest eight promise zones, part of the commitment, says Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack, is to make an award in each announcement to a tribal area and a rural area. We're identifying the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota as the tribal area uh, that we will be uh, focusing our uh, efforts on. And uh, South Carolina Low Country, this is uh, roughly an eight-county area uh, in uh, South Carolina. The goal? This is a effort on the part of the administration to better coordinate uh, federal resources and the federal approach to economic opportunity to sort of uh, negate the impacts of, of poverty in rural areas. The federal government partners with local leaders to increase economic activity, improve educational opportunities, leverage private investment, reduce violent crime, enhance public health, and address other priorities identified by the community. For the full list of Promise Zone recipients this round, go to the USDA website at www.usda.gov. For USDA Radio, Susan Carter, Washington, D.C.